Good morning. Thank you so much for your patience as we prepare to have this wonderful discussion about our end-of-life doula programs here at the University of Vermont. My name is Nicola Willie Fenton. I'm the content marketing manager in the UVM's continuing and distance education department. And we are going to talk with Francesca Arnaby, our program director, and Diane Button, who is a former student and also one of our um, coaches and assistants in the program as well. So we'll learn a little bit more from both of them in just a moment. We're going to talk extensively about what is the role of an end-of-life doula today. The professional certificate program, which you are here to learn about, Francesca and Diane will walk us through a lot of the components of the program and have plenty of time for your questions. And we're so fortunate to have Diane with us as well. She can share both the student perspective and from the instructional side also. And we have a lot of different feedback and quotes and testimonials from students um, that have just completed the program as well. We're also going to talk about those course objectives, so the course structure, and also share information about the fairly new, we've run it a couple times now, the end of life um, companion, uh, animal companion course that we're also offering. So we'll talk about that too, and that application process and deadlines because the course will start again in January. So as I mentioned, my name is Nicole. Thank you so much for being with us today. And Francesca is with us as well. She is our program director and our course facilitator. She's the author of a wonderful book, Cultivating the Doula Heart, The Essentials of Compassionate Care, and a graduate of UVM program. In addition to end-of-life birth doula, end-of-life doula, she's also a birthing doula, and I believe that's where her work began in the doula field. Uh, Diane Button joins us from California. Thank you, Diane, for getting up, which is a little early on your side. We're so happy to have you with us. And Diane's going to talk about completing the program and then also on the instruction side what that experience is like, as she is now a program facilitator as well. And she also founded the End of Life Doula Alliance in Northern California. And we'll talk a little bit about that alliance and how coming together to provide services has really been beneficial for her and her area doulas as well. She's a hospice volunteer and an author. Diane, we're super excited to have you both. So one of the things that we like to talk about in the beginning of the webinars that we do um, on this program is you're going to hear from Francesca and Diane today, but look at all the people that support this program. And one of the things that, and Francesca, I'm going to have you, I'm going to turn on your mic for you. One of the things that we always like to talk about here is the growth of this program and the diversity and experience uh, from different perspectives. And what does this slide mean to you as we continue to see the growth and the interest in the end-of-life care movement? So this side, slide features people who are our subject matter experts within the course and a number of friendly faces that come from all different fields related to end-of-life care. So as I'm looking through, I see some people coming from hospice, palliative care, the funeral industry, people who are working in private practice, even other end-of-life doula trainers. We have a very collaborative spirit within the program. So these are the voices and the expertise that we feature. It also has our facilitation team in here. And what we want for learners to know, or potential learners, is that it's not just one voice you're going to hear throughout the program. It is a vast variety and you will hear perspectives from people who have cared for their own loved ones, people who are medical care providers, people who work in spiritual care, counselors, social work, and doctors, you know, nurses. You will hear from so many people throughout the program. So it's not just one voice, one perspective. It really covers the, the realm and the territory well so that people are able to build a foundational knowledge of what is hospice, what is palliative care, and how can I plug myself in in a way that's going to help create harmony and be complementary? Thank you for sharing that perspective. It's been fascinating for me as a um, person who works, you know, kind of outside of the program just to see how much that slide has grown with the additional course facilitators and the support. So that's really wonderful. So let's, let's keep going, Francesca. Um, many folks ask you this question, what is an end-of-life doula? What does that mean? And I think it's becoming more common as the end-of-life movement and end-of-life care movement seems to be getting, weaving its way into mainstream media a little bit more. But maybe just walk us through, what is the role of an end-of-life doula? It's a great question, and I think that my answer has gotten maybe a little more lengthy and a little more layered 
since we have launched the course, and that is somewhat due to the people who come to us and their specific goals. So initially, I had anticipated that we would be attracting private practice doulas, people who maybe have worked in the birthing sector who want to expand to work at both bookends, people who are hospice volunteers, people who are nearing retirement who may be thinking about hanging a shingle and doing another sort of part-time gig. And what we found is not only do we have those people every time, we also invite people who have a variety of titles and roles, and they're not necessarily planning to leave their current job to become a doula. They want to learn more skills and add more tools to their tool bag to be able to provide the most comprehensive, personalized support to those people that they're serving. So when we think about an end-of-life doula, there's the private practice end-of-life doula, and we can talk about that role. And then there are the nurses with a doula heart and hospice volunteers who also consider themselves to be doulas and community doulas, people who aren't charging any money but are the go-to for their neighbors and their loved ones. When we think about the specific role of an end-of-life doula who is in potentially private practice, either for pay or volunteer, we do look to the birthing doula structure in that we are thinking about planning, preparing, and processing. Those are some of the main tasks that a doula can assist with when we're, when we're working with someone. So just as a birth doula might help someone formulate a birthing plan, an end-of-life doula could assist with the creation of your dying wishes, your end-of-life wishes. So not only how do you want to spend your time that you do have, that we do have, because that's the real focus, is living well up until dying. Also, when you think about that time of dying, and we can all think about this at any point, even in good health, because we are all mortal, how would we want that to look and feel? When we see on this slide, it references vigil. So that's the time of active dying when a person is generally no longer communicative. So what can we have in place ahead of time so that your caregivers, your loved ones, your care team, can still support you in a way that honors you and feels respectful and comforting. We also see some additional offerings here like legacy projects. So that's a lot of work with reflecting back on your life and life review and processing. And also we might be able to come up with projects. So these are generally tangible or digital gifts that can be left behind for someone else. It could be a family cookbook, it could be a scrapbook, it could be mementos and photos, it could be special messages, letters written, it could be a um, recorded interview, audio. There are so many different ways that we can honor a life and share what has been meaningful to that person and their lasting advice that they want to be able to give to to their loved ones and to their community. And so sometimes these videos and legacy gifts are, are displayed at a funeral or a memorial service as well. We can also help with non-medical comfort for the dying. So a, a doula is a non-medical emotional support person. And the coordination of care in that we can keep an eye on all of the facets of care. So that could include helping with the calendar with all the medical appointments and visits from the hospice team or palliative care team or whatever care that person may be receiving. Additionally, the visitor schedule and perhaps a meal train schedule and pet dog walking, pet care, child care, whatever other pieces could feel burdensome and could allow the loved ones of this person to really sit and be together in a more meaningful way. Doulas can sort of lift that burden for people. Such important work, and I'm so thankful that we have so many people that are interested in this kind of work too. Um, Diane, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn on your microphone here because I want to toss over to you. What called you to this kind of work as an end-of-life doula? Well, I've always been interested in meaning and purpose in life. Um, I got my master's degree after my grandfather died and I started interviewing um, aging and dying people about you know what had made their life meaningful. And I really became attracted to the touching stories um, by people who really had taken the time to prepare for the end of their life, who had been intentional 
and thoughtful and really wanted to live well and also die well. And um, so I, I learned about being an end of life doula and I realized that it really is a complement to medical care that we obviously don't provide, but we do, we are caregivers in so many different forms. And it felt like a very full hearted way of stepping into this work in, um, in spiritual, practical, emotional meeting of our clients. And so it, it called me in a way that we could, we could really address so many different aspects of end of life as a doula knowing that we have our parameters and we don't step into the medical arena. But, you know, I really love stepping into the home of somebody and and seeing how we, I, can complement what's going on in the home and look for, for what's missing. And it just is very fulfilling, very fulfilling. So Thank you. I'm glad I found this course and I'm glad I'm doing this work. I feel like there's just so many opportunities to make a difference. Thank you so much for that perspective. We'll come back to you quite a bit throughout the conversation today um, because that perspective is so important to share with our prospective students. Um, Francesca, let's come back a little bit to um, the course. And Diane gave us a nice segue into um, how important this work is um, and, the, and the, the learning opportunities here in our course. Walk us through, and we have a few slides um, following about the different modules. Walk us through what are the objectives and we'll get in a little bit more to the details. We like to provide that strong, solid, comprehensive, foundational knowledge about the end of life realm, including the spiritual, the medical, the social, the emotional, all of it. We present information so that our doulas, our graduates are, are really well prepared to enter into that. They feel like it's very familiar to them. As Part of that, we not only can describe what we see statewide, you know, nationwide, countrywide, worldwide, throughout the world, different cultures, different perspectives, we also ask our learners to look to their own communities and to start building a directory list. So we give them ideas and prompts based off of the topics of the modules, which I know we'll cover soon, and we ask them to look to see what is available nearby them. And they might find, based on the prompts, that something is, something isn't, something more that they didn't, they weren't even aware of. And it also helps them to start networking, which is hugely important. So there's that piece, and we cover so many different topics. And then there's also the introspective piece, which is really well balanced. So we feel strongly that in order for someone to be prepared and to feel confident holding the hand of someone who is facing death, we need to do a lot of our own work as well first. And so that is practicing these exercises that might become our offerings. So like our letters that we write to our loved ones, we kind of launch right into that. We also look back on our own grief and some unhealed wounds and reflect what was supportive, what wasn't supportive, what, what was lacking, what would have been meaningful to us personally. We do a lot of story sharing throughout the discussion boards. So the learning community is, is very rich and we learn from one another in our own different roles, whether it's personally or professionally in what we're sharing. We have reading that we do and all of that put together really allows for our learners to then, by the end of the course, think about how do I want to step forward from this experience? What hats do I want to wear? What's calling to me? What do I feel passionately about? What's what are my strengths? What do I still need to work on? And, and in hopes that we can meet individual goals as varied as they are. And I want to come back to Diane here as well. Um, just thinking about um, what Francesca just described as to the inner workings that need to be done before you can really start doing external work. How, how tough was that? I would imagine that that's a that's a bit tricky for many people. H how was that for you? And what do you recommend now that you've also seen from the facilitator side? Is is that a tough spot for people to go through? It's amazing. It's a beautiful, beautiful place to go. And when I first signed up for the course, I I honestly wasn't expecting it to be as deep. I wasn't really 
totally prepared for what a personal journey I was going to be going on. And um, I'm really grateful that I did because I realized that, you know, stepping in, um, we, we all come to the course, all the different students, all different experiences, nurses, doctors, caregivers, people who are trying to just get some personal growth and, and are doing it so they maybe can take care of their loved ones in the future. But we all come with so much so much and then we begin sharing it and we learn from each other but the beauty of the class is that we're we're learning skills kind of on ourselves first and as francesca said it just it it does two things that really made a difference for me one is i was able to dig deeper into my own you know personal reflections of how i feel about life and end of life and then I was also um, able to see where I was called as a doula. I was able to see, you know, what areas of the work I might I might really want to foster and focus on, you know, in my in my doula group here. So it was really helpful for that. And I I I think that it it wasn't like shocking that it it was so intense, but it was really more than I had expected in terms of the personal depth. But I think it's so important because it just makes us better doulas when we when we go to those places and, and learn from each other as well. And it's a real safe space, which is part of what I love. Like after the first week, it's like a community of of friends. And especially, you know, in our pandemic world, um, it's nice to have a place where we can gather and feel safe and express our emotions and, you know, just dig a little deeper than we do every day. So it's beautiful. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know that uh, many times we hear from our learners um, in their testimonials um, just how profound some of that work um, on their own um, personal work has been. Um, Francesca, let's come back a little bit. Um, you've mentioned um, quite a bit of this, but um, these, you, you know, I, I'm, I can kind of zip through these a little bit because there's a lot um, of intended outcomes, and I think that speaks to the, the depth and the breadth of this program. Um, and I'll back up to kind of this first one, but maybe just touch upon the wide variety of things that students um, will gain from this course that they might not have anticipated. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'm drawn to the second bulleted point, which is about boundaries. And although doula work is unregulated, there's no licensure, there's no overseeing body, we feel really strongly that we need to be mindful of our boundaries. And so we have tenets of doula care that we follow. We have our role and scope that we are mindful of. And when it comes to this module, which is halfway or so through the program, we go into scenarios and we work through these really sticky, difficult, complex, yet realistic. These are actual, pull, they're pulled from real life scenarios and what's going on, the different energies, the different preferences, the different points of view of the variety of people that you would be involved in with potentially when you become somebody's doula or if you're in another role within that care team and, and how do you not only navigate that as a, as a doula, also how do you deal with it emotionally? How do you tend to your own needs and triggers and shadows and what's coming up for you. So this is a, a really important point and we spend a good deal of time going through those really gray areas. And then as we keep going, we spend two of our eight weeks on grief. So the first is our week two and we talk about anticipatory grief. And so that's the number of progressive losses that people experience as they are facing death and as their disease process is progressing. And then in mod seven, later on in the course, we then talk about grief in terms of mourning and bereavement. So that's hugely important. And we do cover special populations and different ethnicities, cultures, religious beliefs, spirituality, as well in mod six. We talk about legacy work, life review quite a bit. We've touched on most of these. Mm -hmm emotional support for decreasing anxiety, so comfort measures that are non-medical, and then developing that atmosphere around someone that feels, as you see, protective, calm, and comforting, very personalized. This is huge for uh, a doula. We don't come in with an agenda of our own. We don't come in 
knowing what's best for anyone else. We work on coming to clarity about our own wishes so that we can really sort of set them aside and know, okay, that's mine, that's not theirs. And then we have space to really explore who are you, what are your values, what are your hopes. And, and this can be a really beautiful experience. I've, I've worked with some people and also some workshops that I run about vigil wishes. And there was one guy who said that if anything, he would want for his space, no matter the time of the year, to be decorated for Christmas. And that would feel comforting to his heart and soul as he was facing the end of his life. So it, it's very unique and, and we really have an eye on that as doulas. And then on this slide too, just talks about um, the course structure. Many of our learners and prospective learners, um, this might be the first time that a learner has joined an online course. Um, and so one of the things that I wanna share and we'll, we'll um, have the information on a later slide is the deadline to register is a week before the start of the course. And the reason that we do that is because there is a orientation that happens the week before and it gives our learners an opportunity to get in, understand Blackboard, understand the platform and feel more comfortable and ask those questions if you're having any technology challenges um, in advance so that you, when the course opens on that first day, on that first Wednesday, you're ready to go. Francesca, just walk us through some of these components because I know this is a, a popular question that students are trying to understand, okay, what is this? Mm -hmm. um, what does asynchronistic mean? Um, what are, how many hours am I going to be spending um, a week on this? And, and Diane, I want you on deck for this because I want you to see um, maybe and talk about your experiences and how you fit this into your life and how you've seen students do that as well. But we'll start with Francesca. And I have an eye on the chat board as well. And there was someone named Emily who asked about, do you need a specific degree? And Nicole, you were just mentioning this, that we really welcome all learners. And we have prepared that orientation in advance, which is just part of the course. It's included. It's not required. People are welcome to take it. It takes about one hour of your time. And that's especially for people who have never done an online class, because this is 100% online. And people who have perhaps not even engaged in an educational offering for decades and decades. We see that. We also have people who have multiple PhDs and we welcome everyone and we meet learners where they are. So we run from Wednesday to Tuesday. So that means that our modules, which we have eight of, will open on a Wednesday morning and then we'll work through that module together as a group and it will close Tuesday night. And then the next module will open the next, the following Wednesday morning. And we have discussion boards, so our assignments are due generally, there's one Friday, but for the most part, Sunday and Tuesday. So you have from Wednesday up until Sunday to really dive into the content, do the work, do the practice exercises, and then it's reflection time starting Sunday. And from Sunday through Tuesday, you're finishing up with the content and also working in the discussion boards, you're posting, and then you're responding to other learners' posts. And with those responsive posts, we're really asking you to practice the doula voice, doula approaches to care, compassionate care. We also have a couple of assignments like building the directory list, and that is supplemental and it runs almost every week. We also have some quizzes throughout almost every week as well. It's asynchronous, so that means no live sessions. You log in when it works well for you, and you just keep an eye on those deadlines for Sundays and Tuesdays. Um, thank you for sharing that. that I, I hope that helps. And, and I definitely want to encourage any questions. Um, one of our team members, Kelly, here is keeping an eye on those questions in the chat box on YouTube. So please do continue to ask questions and we will make sure to get those answered throughout the presentation. Um, Diana, I, I'd love to hear from you. How did you fit this in? How did you make it part of your life? And then what have you seen um, now as a facilitator? How are students managing their time because many are still working, um, so it's a variety of different um, capacities that students have. Yeah. Well, in the beginning, we we ask the learners what you know what are they going to do to be able to fit this in into their lives, and it's interesting how many different creative ways people have of doing something that matters to them and making it work. Um, for me personally, I I 
I set aside a schedule. I set aside six hours a week in um, three two hour segments so that I knew that I would have time to study the course materials and then write some responses, my personal responses and then to my um, other classmates during the course of the week. So I did block off that time, but I always knew that I was going to be digging deeper. And as time went on, I realized personally, there were certain um, weeks, certain modules that I wanted to dig deeper into and one of the things that i think francesca did so beautifully and intentionally was she created this content where we could step into it and do it in eight to ten or twelve hours a week um, and you will get everything done and you will get everything out of the class that you came to get but if you want to get more there are so many other areas to go she always includes at the end of every module um, and even woven throughout it if you want to know more you can go here or go there watch this video read this and um, so i found myself um, doing two things. One, digging a little bit deeper on certain modules, which then might take me some a little bit longer, more like 12 or 14 hours that week, um, all by choice. And also I was saving and downloading and creating files that I could go to later. But one of the other beautiful things about the course is that um, the, the modules stay open after the course for um, learners to go back and revisit so you can you can always go back and you don't have to I realized after a while I don't have to do all this right in the beginning and so that helped me pace myself um, in terms of what I'm seeing as a as a facilitator um, it really is a personal decision how much time you want to put into this class and why are you taking the class so if somebody um, is taking this class for personal growth and they've already done their advanced directive for example, they might not want to go digging deeper into the module about advanced directives and all the different types and such. Whereas if you're going to be an end of life doula and maybe holding workshops that include it, then it would be really helpful to go deeper. So I find that there's a huge variety and we're all about just meeting each learner where they are and respecting what they want to get out of the class and they're adults and we understand that, that they have different interests. So we just meet them where they are and, and let them do what they want to do to get whatever they want out of the class. Excellent point. Thank you for that perspective. I appreciate both the learner side and um, from a facilitator seeing many learners as well. Um, Francesca, let's come back over to you. Um, and I know we've talked a lot about these modules, kind of weaved it into the discussion today. But I think it's helpful for prospective students um, to see kind of the flow of that content laid out a little bit. So maybe just touch upon um, the flow of the course material here. Sure. In our opening module, we're giving a an overview of end-of-life work in general. So we're introducing the role and work of a doula and also what is hospice, what is palliative care, and then sharing a number of very moving stories, whether it's a video or an audio interview. And we've included now that the pandemic is not relenting as quickly as we had all hoped it would. We have also infused content about the pandemic and about what other ways can we care for people at this time and getting um, a, a perspective on what this kind of loss entails during a pandemic. So that's also sprinkled throughout the course. And I know Diane could talk about that as well in her private practice and how she's had to adjust her approaches I want to touch on the bonus module that's listed here and again this is really so that we can cater to a huge variety of learners so that everyone really feels welcome to this table there's a there's a spot for everyone here and so mindfully we have really set aside the the, the content about becoming a private practice doula into one module and it has no required work no assignments attached to it we open it up with module seven because we do feel strongly about building a foundation before you then dive more deeply into the doula realm and doula role. And so we have a whole module that people can access if they're really looking into, okay, I'm really thinking about it either for pay or for volunteer, community doula, private practice doula, whatever title they wanna be able to use, it's up to them. But here are a lot of ideas. We feature people who are working in the field. We have video libraries. We talk about the doula bag, what to pack, ideas for visits and activities. 
And then again, revisiting the idea of the role and scope, really clarifying what is it that we're offering, what are the complementary offerings in addition to that. So, so I feel like that's very important. People who aren't interested in becoming a doula necessarily are, still have these eight modules that are well catered to all human beings. Great. Thank you so much for going over that. And I know we have a few questions coming in. We'll get to those in just a moment. And Diane, I do want to come back to you on how you've adjusted some of your work. Um, I know we've talked about that in a recent podcast episode, so we'll come back to that. Um, there was also a question that I've seen um, that I bet will be put in our chat box here in a minute. I saw it over on YouTube about the community. And um, because there are not live sessions with Francesca and the facilitators and the instructors, um, how do you build that community? And that has never been a challenge, I think, in this course, um, is the lack of community. Uh, it seems like this particular program builds such a strong community that continues well after the course completion. So, Francesca, can you just, um, and there's the question um, from Karen. Thank you, Kelly, for putting that over. Um, why don't you touch on that for just a moment, Francesca, on the community aspect and some of these external communities that continue to grow as well? I would say that personally, to, to be honest, I was surprised by how strongly connected we feel as a group going in. I hadn't had a lot of experience with online learning myself and had my doubts. And then once we opened up our first offering, the learning that we've prepared is, is really rich. And then the learning that happens as we share our stories and perspectives and wisdom with one another is just incredible and in that we are practicing the doula approach and that we're holding people's truths in confidence and that, so it feels very safe we are non-judgmental we are very supportive of one another you know we tend to be the the natural nurturers of the world which means that sometimes we can become quite depleted so to be able to lean on other people who find themselves in that position very frequently, people are turning to you, they're leaning on you. Who do you have? Well, we have each other. We also keep the groups very small. So we have groups of 25, which really helps to build that feeling of a close knit community. And then after we invite people to join our end of life Facebook page, if, if they're interested in that. Also within the groups, we've had some learners who have volunteered to collect contact information and so whoever wants to share that contact information, then they can stay connected over email. They share their phone numbers. So there's a lot of collaboration and sort of planning that happens as we're coming up to the end. And what we found is that by the end of the eight weeks, often it's quite heavy with grief. There's anticipatory grief and people are knowing that the end is coming. And it's a really beautiful heart-wrenching sometimes practice of saying goodbye, sharing gratitude, and letting go. I've seen many, many a quote and testimonial from students saying that. So it is really fascinating. And to me, being an outsider from the course perspective, um, it just shows how strong some of those bonds are that students have created in such a short period of time. So we'll touch base on that um, a little bit more. Um, Diane, I want to I come to you here for a moment because you were so graceful in, and generous in giving me your time uh, as we did an interview several months ago now um, about how your work as an end-of-life doula in Marin County has changed in Northern California. Um, and our podcast, End of Life Care from a Distance, you talked about how you were adjusting. Um, share with me, what has that been like, being a doula um, from a distance and, and in, in, in a different way as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, it, at first, um, it seemed like maybe it was going to be short-lived, and so the adjustments were maybe made around that, like, oh, we can fill in and work differently for a month or two until things get back to normal but obviously that's not happening right now and so it's really had to shift quite a bit over the last few months even since we've we've spoken and we did the podcast i've shifted quite a bit more um i i was doing a lot of work over zoom and over the phone i find a lot of times that the older population doesn't love zoom or know how to get on so i'm on the phone a lot more than i used to be but I think that that I'm we're finding that more and more people are 
are pausing. You know, this this entire pandemic has caused us to go inward and reflect and and calm down, slow down. And so um, I'm finding a different kind of client emerging as well. Younger people, people who are are maybe um, worried or realizing that it's never too early to start thinking about preparing for the end of life. So we've been doing more advanced directives. It's a great place to start as a doula and as a person when it comes to thinking about end of life. And so we can do that as on, on a Zoom call with several people, groups of friends coming together to do their advanced directives. In terms of um, legacy work and life reviews, which I really enjoy doing, um, I have several clients who I'm still doing legacy work with over the phone and the way that I've adapted that is I've taken what I know and I usually work with a family member who's visiting or living with the person during the pandemic and I will work with them to kind of become me and and support their loved one with the legacy project so it's become much more of a family kind of involvement in terms of of legacy and life review um i think i said this last time but i feel like in a way everybody's a client right now i'm finding you know my friends and just neighbors and so many people want to talk about you know what matters like what is what why are we here what is this all about how can i emerge from this pandemic better than before and so i'm i'm really grateful for for the, the tools. And one thing I want to add that's really helped me a lot during the pandemic in terms of communication, to just jump off of what Francesca was just saying about developing community in the course. After the course is over, um, people are invited to join our Facebook um, community as well. And I think Francesca touched on that, but I, I want to say that that's been a very important piece for me um, lately. I, when I need something, I go there. I've had two children um, that have been clients or their family has been clients during this pandemic. And both times I reached out and um, asked for information about books and asked for information about um, memorials and ideas that we could use for the funeral of this little girl. And I just find I'll post something and the next morning I'll wake up with plenty of great ideas. So I'm super grateful for that community as well. But the bottom line is we've, we've really had to adjust just like telemedicine, just like school. And, you know, we're drawn to the bedside. That's our heart, but we can't do that right now. So we listen in different ways. It's working. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Um, and it's been so fascinating to follow this journey along with you um, as things have changed. Um, for some reason, your camera just dropped out right there at the at the end, Diane. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to see if you can turn that back on for us. Um, and Francesca, let's. Um, I'm going to just kind of zip through some of these because I think you've touched on as well that um, oftentimes there's really. Oh, good, Diane's coming back to us. Perfect. <sighs> Sometimes there's a big ahas. There's there's um, more personal, private reflections. I think that that learners have throughout the program. Um, I just I'm not going to read these for everybody. I just wanted to highlight some of the things. Um, also, I, I always find this really great to see the academic and rigorous um, and tender and so comprehensive. You know, the courses is there's a lot to it. Um, and you know, oftentimes we'll get questions. Uh, in online learning, you know, is that the same, is it the same rigor, is it the same academic um, caliber of an in-person course? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, it wouldn't be a University of Vermont course if it wasn't. Um, and the course um, students and learners often say how well organized it is and rich with content. And I think both Diane and, and Francesca have touched on that in terms of the flow as well. Um, I always think that it's really wonderful, and I think Diane mentioned this too, that everyone's kind of a client. The work that you do in the end of life doula course seems to filter out and permeate um, so much of people's lives. Um, and I think that we see that a lot. It, it helps me think about things and think about how my life on earth has made a difference. You know, it's, it's really interesting to see what students have said. Um, clarifying the type of services that they might do if they wanted to start their own business as well. Um, we're going to talk about the um, Companion Animal course in just a moment. 
it's run um, two course, two times now, two sessions, and we have another one coming up in the spring as well. And um, this has been really fascinating to watch this grow and watch the students uh, who just completed this course, um, the things that they're learning. Maybe they already had some sort of interaction with animals, uh, a veterinarian, you know, or do um, Reiki. I've, I've met several people who do um, healing on animals, and what a wonderful compliment this has been to that. Um, and the knowledge base, again, the knowledge that we have from the guest instructors, um, really building upon their expertise and also uh, the foundation of end-of-life doula as well. Um, I'm just going to zip over some of these. Uh, we can talk about the companion animal in just a minute. But Francesca, um, I always love this graphic. Uh, I think it, it really shows prospective learners the full circle and, and really um, complementary skills and things that it isn't just a doula, then of life doula you're learning about. These are skills that can carry through with your life. Um, share with us what is this image and, and how is this used in the course? So this is a description of our doula essentials, really, and we focus on them throughout the course. We really hone in for mods four and five, and that's what we hear. We hear from people as we ask them to take this into their own world and practice some of these concepts, for example, unconditional positive regard, they come back with their reflections and they say, my gosh, I'm parenting a teenager and I've never tried it this way before and it was amazing. And so they speak to working with their colleagues and parenting and partnering and friendships and then also client care and how readily they can infuse so many of these essentials. It's really beautiful. That's so true. We do hear that a lot. Um, so here's just some of the logistic information. The course starts again in January. Um, and as we mentioned, the deadline for registration is the week before. So the course does fill. Every single session we offer five times, the course fills. So if it is something that you're interested in, we highly recommend you reserve your seat for the January start. There will be another uh, kind of later spring course offering as well. Um, but this is really an opportunity for you to save your seat because um, it will fill and then we'll open again the next session uh, soon afterwards. The deposit is required at the time of the registration. And in addition, as we were mentioning, the registration deadline is a week before, so it allows that orientation an opportunity for you to get in and see the course material in terms of the functionality of the course platform and really feel comfortable so when it opens up that following Wednesday, you're ready to go. And the companion animal. So Francesca, walk me through a little bit. Um, we've done this course two times now, and this is a really fascinating um, extension of the doula work, I think. So maybe walk me through what is this, and, I, and we'll go over, I have a slide too, with the two different offerings, the two-week and the four-week. So what we know is that pet loss is felt very deeply by pet owners, and we want to honor that. And we also recognize that this is often a disenfranchised sort of grief. It's not as seen or validated or supported or honored as perhaps the death of a partner or a child or a parent is in our society, yet it really can lead to stifled grief, complicated grief, unhealed wounds, and we want to pay attention to this. And so we welcome people who are potentially working with animals already and also doulas who want to add this as, a, as an offering in their skill set. So it's been amazing for me. It was amazing for me to sort of journey into building the content and finding these amazing subject matter experts to feature. And then again, learning from our students who gather and who feel so passionately about, about this topic. And so what we do is, as you're seeing on the slide, we have a two-week program for our graduates. So this is the specialization for pet loss, for supporting pet loss. And then we have a four-week certificate for people who either haven't taken our program or who would like a refresher and would like to revisit some of our original content. So for the first two weeks of that four-week certificate, we go into those doula essentials. And we have assignments and practice and a lot of rich content. And then for the two weeks, we really focus in on anticipatory loss. We talk about different animals, different pets, whether it's 
cats, dogs, horses, exotic animals, pocket pets, the gamut. We talk about grief and all of its facets. We talk a lot about the differences between caring for humans at end of life and caring for animals in terms of the legalities, because there are unique differences. And then memorialization, how can we honor this bond, honor this being's life, funeral options, disposition options, and children's grief. So many different topics. So it's a, it's a whirlwind of, of a couple of weeks, and it's, it has just been amazing for me to open my mind, to broaden my perspective, to include this as well. Thank you for sharing that too, and it's been really fascinating to watch the interest grow um, about this because um, there's no doubt that our pets are part of our family. So I want to, um, these are very often the questions that you get that are up on this slide, but I wanted to come back to the questions that we have um, that are coming over from our viewers on YouTube. Um, and so let's just, I'm going to go back up here for a moment. Um, we had a question, and Eleanor kind of had a, a little bit of a follow-up as well. Eleanor asks, will, will we be able to dive in to the doula field following the completion? And, and I think you've touched on that. It, it really kind of depends on, is, is that what you want to do? You know, sometimes it's complementary skills to what you're doing, a nurse or hospice care. And other times people do want to be like Diane and say, I think I want to do this. And so Francesca, let's get your perspective. And then Diane, I'd love to hear from you how you were able to transition into an actual um, service role. So in my mind, we prepare people well with the foundational skills that they need in order to become a doula. What I always encourage people to do is think about what really speaks to you and start there. Start small and then build. What people are sometimes feeling unprepared for is that this is really an emerging field still. We're in its infancy. So there's a lot of community education that needs to happen alongside all of the components that go into legally starting a business. And sometimes for doulas, you know, our preference is to be at the bedside, is to be providing emotional care and support. It can be difficult to also put energy into learning what you need to do in order to, you know, pick a name in your state and launch your LLC and think about marketing and building a website and networking and then the financial part that all of those pieces are required if you're going to be charging money for a service. So we want to be realistic and say this is an undertaking. This will be an effort and it is possible. I always encourage people to work with SCORE. So it's a, a volunteer office of business mentors that they give their expertise out for free and they will hold your hand through creating a business plan, and step-by-step, step, what do you need to do to be ready to go, which is invaluable. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Diane, I'd love to hear from you. How did you, how did you do that? To how did you transition out from the course completion into um, the Doula Alliance? Oh, Diane, we can't hear you. Hang on just one second. Maybe turn back on your microphone. Sorry. I thought we had you, maybe with the Am camera. Am I good now? There you are. Great. Okay, so start over, okay. please. Um, I was just going to say, I think I can piggyback back pretty well off what Francesca said and just add a couple things that, that worked for me and for some of those in our, in our group. Um, first of all, a lot of people go and volunteer at hospice. It's a really good place to get experience at the bedside and also have further training and, and supervisors and other people to talk to and learn from. So. Um, I, I think that's a great place to start. Also, um, I think the question was, like, are you prepared to go out and be a doula after you complete the course? And I would say yes, in that there is the depth of learning available to you so that you can know what you need to know in terms of your doula toolkit. But even me, I still feel like a beginner. I Every time I knock at somebody's door, I try to leave all my issues and ego at the door and open open mind step in without knowing what is going to happen i'm i don't even know what somebody wants really until i've gotten in there and and kind of observed the situation and realized sometimes you're not even there for the client you might be there for a family member and so it's it's always about having a beginner's mind and an open mind and so even as a facilitator 
of this course, I feel like I'm one of the learners as well. And I learn right alongside of everyone every single day. And there, so there's always more to know. So there's that. And then the other thing I was going to say is that finding groups in your area has been a great, I think it's really actually happened a lot more since the pandemic where people are realizing that that we don't want to work alone we're already alone so we're forming groups and we did that um and uh, uh, in a local community and then across the bay in the east bay we have friends who have another group and there's other people we know in the south bay and so we refer out and we work together and so i i, I think that that coming together through the pandemic in a way that um, doulas can meet each other and then bring all of our skill sets together and support each other really helps when you're just stepping out. Wonderful perspective. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, I want to come back to um, Francesca. We have a couple questions. Um, I had seen the question from Christine asking if we've had any um, uh, Canadians take the course. And I think I suspect we have. We've had people from all over the world to take this course, so um, that would be probably the short answer to that. Um, and then the question to you from Connie: Will we receive an ebook in addition to online readings? Um, also, do we have unlimited access to the information, which we've talked about? There, the course is still open for um, several weeks. I don't know exactly when it kind of cuts off for for six weeks, for six months. For uh, Kelly just shared six months after the completion, um, and so the readings are in there too. So do you think that that would complement or maybe answer her question related to an ebook? Yeah, we don't have a specific ebook, but we do have a lot of content and then some external links and documentaries and then the two books that are required, chapters from those books, a lot of different types of delivery, content delivery. Um, is closure a topic? And I suspect that it is weaved in and out <laughs> through a lot of the um, material. What's yeah, the closure is interesting. That can be kind of a triggering word for some people. And sometimes people have strong feelings about that because we are supporting people through their time of living up until their time of dying. So there's no way to sort of neatly tie a bow on checking off your list. And at the same time, we really do try to address with people what feels undone. What, how, what makes you feel unsettled and, and how can we support you with that? So whether it's thinking about an argument, thinking about you know, a certain strange relationship, thinking about your legacy and what you would like to leave behind or messages that you're holding in your heart silently, there are a number of ways that we can work sort of toward that, but it's, a, it's not usually an end point and then we feel like we're done, we're good because it's fluid, we're living still and we're human and we're people and we're experiencing life every day. I want to um, address this question. I know that Emily had asked this and Susan over in the chat on YouTube kind of um, raised her hand related to this question too is that um, Emily's asking, listening to all of you and reading the slides, I am beginning to weep for those that are going through the pain of grief. Will I be able to be a doula if my empathy levels are so high? Um, and I'd love to hear from Diane too. Is that a concern that a lot of people have coming into the course? And then how can they, how can they work through that? Now, and I think that that we're we're all grieving and having a lot of emotions. And I mean, the question: Can you be a doula if you know you're? What happens is we go through the course, and the idea is that you start processing some of these things so that you can look more clearly at yourself and you can answer that question for yourself. I mean, I really do believe that this work isn't for everybody. You, everybody's not called to be a doula. Everybody can learn and grow and become, um, I think, better or have a more meaningful life because of taking this course. But that doesn't mean that you're going to come out and feel called necessarily to be a doula. I do feel that um, Sometimes it's really sad and um, I have a hard time sometimes, but I realize that I'm also called to be the calmest person in the room at all times. I don't, if I have to grieve or I have to cry, I not saying that I would never cry in front of somebody, but I try my best to keep my emotions 
you know, to myself so that I can serve while I'm with someone who's dying. And like I said, I've had a couple of children that I've worked with through the pandemic and then people who didn't get to say goodbye to their loved ones because of COVID. And it's been really, really hard to hear all these stories. And sometimes you have to step away. And that's why self-care is so important. And we actually cover that as one of the modules in our course, because it, it, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. And then, you know, it, it's it's up to each individual to decide if, if this is something that they feel called to do. Thank you for sharing that perspective, too. Francesca, what, what is your thoughts to that question? Well, it's something that I think a lot on and in Cultivating the Doula Heart, I actually go through and differentiate sympathy, empathy, and compassion, because I feel like those of us who are naturally empathic, who can really feel the feelings of others, we are at a higher risk of burnout and of emotional depletion. So we have to be really careful of that. And then within the course, we put that into use, especially when it comes to curiosity and coming to clarity about our own stuff and unconditional positive regard, which encourages us to place our trust in the other person. So we believe in that other person fully and we believe in that other person's wisdom. We don't know best, they know best, and we're going to support that takes the pressure off of us to make decisions for someone else and to be responsible for their journey. Our responsibility lies within our companionship and our ability to see and hear and validate what that person is going through. So I actually think it's a really important practice that we move from a place of empathy and move to compassion, which is a witnessing and it's an honoring of what's happening. Thank you for sharing that and, and so um, clearly articulating that as well. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to um, ask Connie's question. Francesca, how long have you been doing um, end of life, working in the end of life field? Well, I would say naturally as a family member for, for quite some time. And then more formally, it's been about four years in different capacities. So that's within my ability to study the work and lead the course, develop the program, learn as much as I possibly can as a hospice volunteer and also as a community doula. So stepping in to support people who call on me for my assistance. And, and Diane, how, how long, um, when did you complete the course? And, and I, I, to Francesca's point, maybe you have been doing this work without knowing that it was an end of life doula um, work that you were doing. Yeah, well, I um I was a, I've been a hospice volunteer for about 15 years now, and I also did a lot of that community work, especially in my neighborhood. So I would I was kind of the person that everyone would call and sit with people who were dying in my community, friends and family, and such, um, without having it be a business or really even understanding that I was an end of life doula at the time. And then I started taking courses and. Um, I took the University of Vermont class um, in 2019 at the beginning. I finished it in March, and I, um, but I had already started putting a business together in 2018, so it's been about two years that I've had a, a, a business as well as the volunteer work that I do. Great. Thank you for answering that. It's nice to hear that perspective. Um, we are going to wrap up. We're at time. I just wanted to um, reiterate again some of those deadlines because as I mentioned earlier, the course fills every single session. So if it's something you're interested in, I'd highly recommend you jump in there and register. Um, and here's the information again for the Companion Animal course, which also starts um, in, in you know, kind of still winter officially um, in February. Um, thank you everyone for these wonderful questions that you have asked today. If there is something that we weren't able to answer, please do send us an email at learn at uvm.edu. We will make sure to get answers to those questions. And there's a lot of information on our website and in our blog. There's a lot of um, student profiles and stories of, of folks sharing their stories as to how they've incorporated this work into their life. Um, Diane and Francesca, thank you both for sharing not only the experiences in the course, but also your own personal experiences. Appreciate the time both of you have taken. Um, and I wish you both a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. And everyone's welcome to join the Facebook group if people are interested. Last minute thought. That's great. Thanks, Thank Bridget. you. Thank you, Diane. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.